Book Five, Sections Five through Seven of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Five, Sections Five through Seven. Five. And now, taking each constitution separately, we must see what follows from the principles already laid down. Revolutions in democracies are generally caused by the intemperance of demagogues, who either in their private capacity lay information against rich men until they compel them to combine, for a common danger unites even the bitterest enemies, or coming forward in public stir up the people against them. The truth of this remark is proved by a variety of examples. At cost, the democracy was overthrown, because wicked demagogues arose, and the notables combined. At Rhodes, the demagogues not only provided pay for the multitude, but prevented them from making good to the triarchs the sums which had been expended by them, and they, in consequence of the suits which were brought against them, were compelled to combine and put down the democracy. The democracy at Heraclea was overthrown shortly after the foundation of the colony by the injustice of the demagogues, which drove out the notables, who came back in a body and put an end to the democracy. Much in the same manner, the democracy at Megara was overturned. There the demagogues drove out many of the notables, in order that they might be able to confiscate their property. At length the exiles, becoming numerous, returned, and, engaging in defeating the people, established the oligarchy. The same thing happened with the democracy of Sime, which was overthrown by Thrasymachus. And we may observe that in most states the changes have been of this character. For sometimes the demagogues, in order to curry favor with the people, wrong the notables, and so force them to combine. Either they make a division of their property, or diminish their incomes by the imposition of public services and sometimes they bring accusations against the rich that they may have their wealth to confiscate. Of old, the demagogue was also a general, and then democracies changed into tyrannies. Most of the ancient tyrants were originally demagogues. They are not so now, but they were then, and the reason is that they were generals and not orators, for oratory had not yet come into fashion. Whereas in our day, when the art of rhetoric has made such progress, the orators lead the people, but their ignorance of military matters prevents them from usurping power. At any rate, instances to the contrary are few and slight. Tyrannies were more common formerly than now, for this reason also, that great power was placed in the hands of individuals. Thus a tyranny arose at Miletus out of the office of the Pritonus, who had supreme authority in many important matters. Moreover, in those days, when cities were not large, the people dwelt in the fields, busy at their work and their chiefs, if they possessed any military talent, seized the opportunity, and, winning the confidence of the masses by professing their hatred of the wealthy, they succeeded in obtaining the tyranny. Thus at Athens, Pisistratus led a faction against the men of the plain, and Theagenes at Megara slaughtered the cattle of the wealthy, which he had found by the riverside, where they had put them to graze in land not their own. Dionysius, again, was thought worthy of the tyranny, because he denounced Daphnius and the rich, his enmity to the notables, won for him the confidence of the people. Changes also take place from the ancient to the latest form of democracy, for where there is a popular election of the magistrates, and no property qualification, the aspirants for office get hold of the people, and contrive at last even to set them above the laws. A more or less complete cure for this state of things is for the separate tribes, and not the whole people, to elect the magistrates. These are the principal causes of revolutions in democracies. 6. There are two patent causes of revolutions in oligarchies. 1. First, when the oligarchs oppress the people, for then anybody is good enough to be their champion, especially if he be himself a member of the oligarchy as Ligdemus at Naxos, who afterwards came to be tyrant. But revolutions which commence outside the governing class may be further subdivided. Sometimes, when the government is very exclusive, the revolution is brought about by persons of the wealthy class who were excluded, 
as happened at Massalia and Istros and Heraclea and other cities. Those who had no share in the government created a disturbance, until first the elder brothers and then the younger were admitted, for in some places father and son, in others elder and younger brothers, do not hold office together. At Massalia the oligarchy became more like a constitutional government, but at Istros ended in a democracy, and at Heraclea was enlarged to six hundred. At Nidos, again, the oligarchy underwent a considerable change, for the notables fell out among themselves, because only a few shared in the government. There existed among them the rule already mentioned, that father and son not hold office together, and if there were several brothers, only the eldest was admitted. The people took advantage of the quarrel, and, choosing one of the notables to be their leader, attacked and conquered the oligarchs, who were divided, and division is always a source of weakness. The city of Erythri, too, in old times was ruled, and ruled well, by the Basilidae, but the people took offense at the narrowness of the oligarchy and changed the constitution. 2. Of internal causes of revolutions and oligarchies, one is the personal rivalry of the oligarchs, which leads them to play the demagogue. Now, the oligarchical demagogue is of two sorts. Either A, he practices upon the oligarchs themselves, for although the oligarchy are quite a small number, there may be a demagogue among them, as at Athens, Caracles's party won power by courting the thirty, that of Phrenicus by courting the four hundred. Or B, the oligarchs may play the demagogue with the people. This was the case at Larissa, where the guardians of the citizens endeavored to gain over the people because they were elected by them, and such is the fate of all oligarchies in which the magistrates are elected, as at Abidus, not by the class to which they belong, but by the heavy-armed or by the people, although they may be required to have a high qualification, or to be members of a political club. Or, again, where the law courts are composed of persons outside the government, the oligarchs flatter the people in order to obtain a decision in their own favor, and so they change the constitution. This happened at Heraclea in Pontus. Again, oligarchies change whenever any attempt is made to narrow them, for then those who desire equal rights are compelled to call in the people. Changes in the oligarchy also occur when the oligarchs waste their private property by extravagant living, for then they want to innovate, and either try to make themselves tyrants, or install someone else in the tyranny, as Hipparinus did Dionysius at Syracuse, and as at Amphipolis a man named Cleotimus introduced Chalcidian colonists, and when they arrived stirred them up against the rich. For a like reason in Aegina, the person who carried on the negotiation with Chares endeavored to revolutionize the state. Sometimes a party among the oligarchs tried directly to create a political change. Sometimes they robbed the treasury, and then either the thieves, or, as happened at Apollonia and Pontus, those who resist them in their thieving, quarrel with the rulers. But an oligarchy which is at unity with itself is not easily destroyed from within. Of this we may see an example at Pharsalus, for there, although the rulers are few in number, they govern a large city, because they have a good understanding among themselves. Oligarchies, again, are overthrown when another oligarchy is created within the original one, that is to say, when the whole governing body is small, and yet they do not all share in the highest offices. Thus at Elis, the governing body was a small senate, and very few ever found their way into it, because the senators were only ninety in number, and were elected for life, and out of certain families, in a manner similar to the Lacedaemonian elders. Oligarchy is liable to revolutions, alike in war and in peace. In war because, not being able to trust the people, the oligarchs are compelled to hire mercenaries, and the general who is in command of them often ends in becoming a tyrant, as Timophanes did at Corinth or if there are more generals than one, they make themselves into a company of tyrants. Sometimes the oligarchs, fearing this danger, give the people a share in the government because their services are necessary to them. And in time of peace, from mutual distrust, the two parties hand over the defense of the state to the army and to an arbiter between the two factions, who often ends the master of both. This happened at Larissa when Simos the Aluid had the government, and at Abidus in the days of Aphiades in the political clubs. 
revolutions also arise out of marriages or lawsuits which lead to the overthrow of one party among the oligarchs by another. Of quarrels about marriages, I have already mentioned some instances. Another occurred at Eritrea, where Diagoras overturned the oligarchy of the knights because he had been wronged about a marriage. A revolution at Heraclea and another at Thebes both arose out of decisions of law courts upon a charge of adultery. In both cases the punishment was just, but executed in the spirit of party at Heraclea upon Eurytion and at Thebes upon Archias, for their enemies were jealous of them, and so had them pilloried in the Agora. Many oligarchies have been destroyed by some members of the ruling class taking offense at their excessive despotism, for example the oligarchy at Nidus and at Caius. Changes of constitutional governments, and also of oligarchies which limit the office of counselor, judge, or other magistrate to persons having a certain money qualification, often occur by accident. The qualification may have been originally fixed according to the circumstances of the time, in such a manner as to include in an oligarchy a few only, or in a constitutional government the middle class. But after a time of prosperity, whether arising from peace or some other good fortune, the same property becomes many times as valuable, and then everybody participates in every office. This happens sometimes gradually and insensibly, and sometimes quickly. These are the causes of changes and revolutions in oligarchies. We must remark generally, both of democracies and oligarchies, that they sometimes change, not into the opposite forms of government, but only into another variety of the same class. I mean to say, from those forms of democracy and oligarchy which are regulated by law, into those which are arbitrary, and conversely. 7. In aristocracies, revolutions are stirred up when a few only share in the honors of the state a cause which has already been shown to affect oligarchies. For an aristocracy is a sort of oligarchy, and, like an oligarchy, is the government of a few, although few not for the same reason, hence the two are often confounded. And revolutions will be most likely to happen, and must happen, when the mass of the people are of the high-spirited kind, and have a notion that they are as good as their rulers. Thus at Lacedaemon, the so-called Parthenii, who were the illegitimate sons of the Spartan peers, attempted a revolution, and, being detected, were sent away to colonize Tarentum. Again, revolutions occur when great men, who are at least of equal merit, are dishonored by those higher in office, as Lysander was by the kings of Sparta, or when a brave man is excluded from the honors of the state, like Cynodon, who conspired against the Spartans in the reign of Agesilaus or, again, when some are very poor and others very rich, a state of society which is most often the result of war, as at Lacedaemon in the days of the Mycenaean War. This is proved from the poem of Tertius, entitled Good Order, for he speaks of certain citizens who were ruined by the war and wanted to have a redistribution of the land. Again, revolutions arise when an individual who is great, and might be greater, wants to rule alone, as at Lacedaemon, Pausanias, who was general in the Persian War, or like Hanno at Carthage. Constitutional governments and aristocracies are commonly overthrown owing to some deviation from justice in the constitution itself. The cause of the downfall is, in the former, the ill-mingling of the two elements, democracy and oligarchy, in the latter of the three elements, democracy, oligarchy, and virtue, but especially democracy and oligarchy. For to combine these is the endeavor of constitutional governments, and most of the so-called aristocracies have a like aim, but differ from polities in the mode of combination. Hence some of them are more and some less permanent. Those which incline more to oligarchy are called aristocracies, and those which incline to democracy constitutional governments. And therefore the latter are the safer of the two, for the greater the number, the greater the strength, and when men are equal, they are contented. But the rich, if the constitution gives them power, are apt to be insolent and avaricious, and, in general, whichever way the constitution inclines, in that direction it changes, as either party gains strength, a constitutional government becoming a democracy, an aristocracy, an oligarchy. But the process may be reversed, and aristocracy may change into democracy. 
This happens when the poor, under the idea that they are being wronged, force the constitution to take an opposite form. In like manner, constitutional governments change into oligarchies. The only stable principle of government is equality according to proportion, and for every man to enjoy his own. What I have just mentioned actually happened at Theriae, where the qualification for office, at first high, was therefore reduced, and the magistrates increased in number. The notables had previously acquired the whole of the land contrary to law, for the government tended to oligarchy, and they were able to encroach. But the people, who had been trained by war, soon got the better of the guards kept by the oligarchs, until those who had had too much gave up their land. Again, since all aristocratical governments incline to oligarchy, the notables are apt to be grasping. Thus at Lacedaemon, where property tends to pass into few hands, the notables can do too much as they like, and are allowed to marry whom they please. The city of Locri was ruined by a marriage connection with Dionysius, but such a thing could never have happened in a democracy, or in a well-balanced aristocracy. I have already remarked that in all states revolutions are occasioned by trifles. In aristocracies, above all, they are of a gradual and imperceptible nature. The citizens begin by giving up some part of the constitution, and so with greater ease the government change something else, which is a little more important, until they have undermined the whole fabric of the state. At Thurii, there was a law that generals should only be re-elected after an interval of five years, and some young men, who were popular with the soldiers of the guard for their military prowess, despising the magistrates, and thinking that they would easily gain their purpose, wanted to abolish this law, and allow their generals to hold perpetual commands, for they well knew that the people would be glad enough to elect them. Whereupon the magistrates, who had charge of these matters, and who are called counsellors, at first determined to resist, but they afterwards consented, thinking that, if only this one law was changed, no further inroad would be made on the constitution. But other changes soon followed, which they in vain attempted to oppose, and the state passed into the hands of the revolutionists, who established a dynastic oligarchy. All constitutions are overthrown either from within or from without, the latter when there is some government close at hand having an opposite interest, or at a distance but powerful. This was exemplified in the old times of the Athenians and the Lacedaemonians. The Athenians everywhere put down the oligarchies, and the Lacedaemonians the democracies. I have now explained what are the chief causes of revolutions and dissensions in states. End of Book 5, Sections 5-7